Sure. OK, cool. All right. Um, yeah, today I'm talking about uh, the combination of serverless and GraphQL and how you can use it to build backends. First, a very quick introduction. So my name is Nicolas Burke, and I work at a company. We're based in Berlin. We're a startup, and we're building a backend development framework called GraphQL for backend development, and we're using GraphQL and serverless technologies. The agenda for today is that I want to give a brief introduction to GraphQL, just so we're all on the same page uh, about the main concepts. Then I'll very briefly talk about serverless functions and how we got there. Uh, then I'll talk about serverless GraphQL backends and how you can build them with GraphQL. And finally, I'll give a quick demo of the new GraphQL framework. So let's start with a basic introduction to GraphQL and the big question, what is GraphQL? So first and foremost, it's an API standard that was developed and open sourced by, um, um, by Facebook um, in 2015. <clears throat> And it's a query language for APIs. So it's very important to understand that despite the fact that it shares the same suffix with SQL, so it's a query language, but it doesn't have anything to do with databases. It's an API technology, not a database, uh, not a database technology, and that's a very common misconception about GraphQL. And it essentially enables a declarative way of fetching and updating data against an API. To understand how it works, let's take a look at a quick example of a blogging application where we have the following profile screen. So on the top of the screen, we have the first name of the user whose profile we show. Then we um, display all the posts of that user. And finally, we also want to display the last three followers of that particular user. So how would we tackle this particular situation with a REST API? Typically, in a REST API, we would have three different endpoints that would cater the needs for that specific profile screen. So we would have the slash users endpoint to return some information about a given user, then the users ID posts endpoint to return all the posts of a specific user, and then finally, the users ID followers endpoint to return the, uh, the followers of a specific user. So how would we tackle this then um, when we actually have to implement uh, the application now and implement this uh, profile screen? So effectively, we have to make three requests to all these different endpoints. The first request would be a get request to the user's ID endpoint to get the information about the user so that we can display the first name. And what's really obvious already from this um, from this payload that we receive from the server is that we actually only need the first name of the user from that payload, but we are still downloading additional information. So we're putting weight on the user's data plan without actually needing the information. And then we would go and hit the second endpoint <coughs> um, to fetch all the posts. And again, we would probably download a lot of additional information while we're only interested in the title of uh, each post. But at least we have the post titles now, and we can display them on the profile screen. And finally, the same for the, um, for the followers that we want to display. So we send the GET request to the followers endpoint. We get the response back from the server, um, potentially, again, additional data. And at least we can render the different um, followers on the profile screen now. How would we solve the same situation with GraphQL? So the big difference between a REST API and a GraphQL API is that with a REST API, you usually have a couple of different endpoints that return fixed data structures. With GraphQL, you only have one single endpoint that returns flexible data structures. How does that work? Because the client can submit a query to the server, and that query um, precisely describes the data requirements of the client, so you can precisely ask for exactly the data that you need at any given moment. And with GraphQL, we would simply um, send an HTTP post, post request um, where um, the body of the post request contains the following query. And here we can exactly ask for the data that we need. So we need the user with a particular ID, we need the name, we need the titles of the posts, and we need the last three followers. So now we get exactly the information that we need from the server and we can display everything at once because we only made an, um, one single request and we didn't actually um, fetch additional data that we don't need in the application. The next concept that I want to talk about is the GraphQL schema. So 
When we are talking about GraphQL, it's very important to understand that the GraphQL schema is essentially the core of GraphQL. So it's strongly typed and it's written in what's called the schema definition language. And the schema definition language has a type system that you can use to express the capabilities of your API. So the schema really defines the, um, the capabilities of your API and thus is the contract for client-server communication. And it has three special types that are called query, mutation, and subscription. And these kind of de define the entry points for your API. And we'll take a look at an example. So that's quite abstract right now. We'll go into an example now. So here we see the schema definition language for a simple chat application. We define two types, the person and the message type. Um, and um, each of these types has a number of fields. So we have a name that is of type string. and um, the messages which represent a one-to-many relationship between the person and the message type. Now let's talk about these root types and their special role in the GraphQL schema. So when we define a, or um, when we want to be able to send a query like this to ask for one particular message from the API, what we have to do, we have to somehow um, put that into our schema. And the way how to do this is by writing the query type and we are putting a field on the query type that is called message. And this will allow us to actually go ahead and send this particular query to the API. If we wanted to ask for all the messages from the API, we could define a root field that is called all messages and we would um, again have to put it onto the query type. And for mutations, so mutations are, GraphQL, are the GraphQL way how you can update data in the backend. So queries are only for fetching data, and mutations are for updating, creating, and deleting data in the backend. So here we have exactly the same principle in that when we want to send a mutation that looks like this, we have to go and add the corresponding field with the parameters to the mutation type. If we want to update a, specific message, uh, update a specific message, we have to do the same. And of course, uh, exactly the same again when we want to delete a message. So here we would have the full schema that defines an API that allows to create, update, and delete messages. So it essentially provides a CRUD API for the message type, but it's, only, it's not really the full schema because with this API, with this schema, we can't really do anything with a person type yet. So, but it still serves as a good example to understand like, what, how do we have to write our GraphQL schema so that um, the, 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 the capabilities that we expect from our API are exposed. All right, let's now briefly talk about serverless functions and breaking the monolith. So we have a couple of, we've had a couple of talks today already about serverless functions and microservices. So let's start with how we all got there, with the monolithic architectures. So there are a couple of bonus points to monolithic architectures, such as you usually used to have a relatively simple team structure. You usually, uh, you usually just had one, um, one engineering team, and you didn't have a lot of communication overhead. When you're using microservices, you're going to sc scale your uh, whole organization vertically, and you have more, commu um, more communication between the different teams that you have to take uh, 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 care of with processes. And when you were using a strongly typed language to implement your backend, like Java, for example, then you also got global type safety. So all the different components of your applications were aware of the structure of the data that is flowing through the system. But we all know that um, monolithic architectures are not really the way how we want to build applications today. So the problems, of course, are that they are really hard to test. Um, for deployment workflows, it's also relatively difficult to have like, continuous integration and you can't have really fast deployment cycles and they also don't really scale well. So the answer to this is microservices. They solve a lot of the problems that I just mentioned with the monolith. So it's, um, it's easier to test, it's easier to deploy because you can deploy one service at a time, you don't have this single point of failure anymore, and um, you, uh, you gain a lot more flexibility. 
But with new technologies, there are also new challenges to be solved. So now you have to organize and orchestrate the interplay of different services. And you can use frameworks for that or something, but it's still a challenge to really make sure um, that all the services play well together. Then you have to think about how you separate the stateful and the stateless parts of your application. So where do you put the database? Who's allowed to access the database? How do you deal with synchronization and all this kind of stuff? And of course, when you have dependencies between microservices, how do the microservices actually talk to each other? And there, people came up with the term event-driven architecture, which really is a very good, um, very good idea and um, largely accepted idea of how you should build your applications. So um, if two microservices need to communicate, they do this loosely coupled through events, where we have a pub subsystem from one microservice and um, a different microservice can subscribe to the events of that one microservice and uh, will be informed whenever that event then actually happens. And the next evolution of this, so we, were, we started with the monolith, then we got to microservices, and now we are at serverless functions. So you can somewhat think of serverless functions as the next step in that evolution where we don't deploy a single service as a web server anymore, but instead we really deploy individual functions. So we literally write a source file. If we um, write a JavaScript file, then we're writing simply one function into that file, and this is responsible for one particular piece of functionality in our system. Um, and serverless functions, just like a web server, can be invoked via an HTTP endpoint. And we have a number of functions as a service providers that we can use that make this whole deployment workflow a lot easier, such as AWS Lambda or Google Cloud Functions, Microsoft Azure. So we have a couple of these today. All right. So the GraphQL framework um, allows you to build serverless GraphQL backends. And the way how it does this is by providing a new level of abstraction for backend development. What we do is we're effectively abstracting away your database and we automatically generate a CRUD API for you. So you don't have to deal with SQL anymore, neither in defining your actual schema for the database nor by writing uh, SQL query, uh, uh, queries, but you're defining your data model just using the schema definition language that we saw before. And then we generate this automatic CRUD API that is very similar to what we just saw on the slide. Um, then we have an event-driven core to implement business logic to invoke serverless functions that you can configure through the framework. And we have a global type system that is determined by the GraphQL schema. So we are getting back this advantage that we lost with going from the monolith to a microservice architecture, this global type system, which gives all the different components that need to communicate inside our system a lot of safety. How do we um, leverage um, the serverless functions with GraphQL? So we have three different kinds of functions. The first one is called hooks. That is for synchronous validation and transformation of data. Then we've got subscriptions, which are triggering um, a synchronous events. And finally, we've got resolver functions, which allow you to extend the CRUD GraphQL API with custom queries and mutations. Let's take a look at a quick example of how, this, um, how the subscription functions work. So um, let's take the model that we had before with the person type, and we want to send a welcome email to the new user. So here is our system, and it somewhat looks like this, that on the right we've got the function runtime, and here we've got the event system, and then client applications. So to set up the subscription and be informed about events when new users are created, we have to send over this GraphQL subscription query um, to the event system. It's now stored in the event system, and we're waiting for an event to happen that relates to the person type. So this could be that a person is updated, that a person is created, or that a person is deleted. So now a client app actually goes ahead and creates a new person with this payload. So now the subscription actually goes and fires and sends over this payload to the function that we implemented in the function runtime, and that is sitting there and waiting for the event. Um, yeah, and that's how it works. And now you're going uh, 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 to see exactly that example in practice. So um, the first thing I want to do is I want to show you how you can get started with a GraphQL project. And if you've used the serverless framework um, before, then a lot of these things are going to be somewhat familiar to you. 
So <clears throat> we have um, a couple of components inside the graphcool.yaml file. And the most important one here on top are the types. And this types.graphql file defines the data model of your application. So let's quickly take a look at what this types.graphql file contains at the moment. And this is really exactly the person type that we saw on the slide before with the name and the email property right here. And the fact that uh, we don't have an exclamation mark here means that this field is not required. So the name field right here is re uh, required. If we tried to create a new person object without providing the name, then the server would reject our um, request. Um, not, so with the email, um, not so with the email field, because that is not required here. OK, so the first thing I want to show is the CRUD API that we generate for you. And here um, I. Um, in the folder uh, where we have the graphcool.yaml file, which I just showed, and the types.graphql file. And um, what you have to do now to get your own GraphQL backend up and running is simply call the graphcool deploy command. So what we are now doing is we're deploying this service with this one uh, type as your data model and generating a CRUD GraphQL API for you. And you can just go ahead and test this API right away in what's called a GraphQL playground. So you can uh, type the GraphQL playground command, or you can grab the actual HTTP endpoint and put it inside a browser window. What I'm going to do, because then I can increase the font size. And uh, a GraphQL playground is somewhat similar to a tool like Postman in that it lets you allow or it um, lets you explore the capabilities of your GraphQL API in an interactive manner. So we can um, actually go and send this all persons query that we saw on the slides before and ask for all the persons, their IDs and their name in the database. If I send this query, the server is just going to return an empty array because we haven't created any persons in the database yet. But we can simply go ahead and change that by creating a new person with the create person mutation that we also saw before. So we sent this. We now created this person in the database. And uh, when we send the all persons query again, we actually see that this person is now returned by the server. OK, so that's the GraphQL CRUD API that you get just from defining a type in the GraphQL schema definition language. And now I want to show you how we uh, integrate serverless functions. And the first example that I want to do is the um, sending um, the welcome email to a new person that registered. Let me quickly show you the code that I'm using for that. So first, we define the subscription query, kind of similar to what we saw on the slide with one minor um, exception is this filter here where we express that we are only uh, interested in created mutations, because otherwise this function would also fire for uh, updated and deleted mutations. So here we specifically say that uh, we are only interested in uh, created mutations. So um, the function was already created. So when I actually go ahead inside here and I create a new person with an email, and I'm going to take my personal email for that um, and open up my email client right here. Create it. The code in, GraphQ, uh, in the um, welcome email.js file is invoked, which effectively takes in the event where we have the payload of the subscription query, so the name and the email, and then I'm just using the Mailgun API to send an email. And here, we just received it um, with the greeting, which I defined right here. So that's how you can integrate uh, subscriptions for um, real-time um, events effectively. Then I want to show you a use case um, that was mentioned a couple of times in the previous GraphQL talks here when you want to wrap a REST API. So you want to put a GraphQL layer on top of a REST API. So here I have defined a resolver function that uses the following uh, query. So we want to retrieve a random dog image from a public dog image API. Um, here is the root field that we have to call for that. 
And here is the implementation. So here is the HTTP endpoint that we are effectively wrapping with our GraphQL API right now. I have to go and run GraphQL deploy again to actually activate this function. And then I can go back to the playground. <coughs> Deployed. I have to reload the playground. And now I can just access the random dog image URL here. And just to be sure that it worked, let's take a look at that one. Here, it's an actual dog. Um, and the last one that I want to show, if we have enough time, is how you can do data validation. Um, I don't have enough time anymore, but um, just want to close off very quickly. If you want to see a um, practical example of that, you can talk to me later. Um, we have very big news coming up at GraphQL, so we're actually, or the first announcement of that is going to happen this afternoon, and then the next one in roughly two weeks when GraphQL Summit is happening in San Francisco. So stay tuned, and that's all I have today. Thank you. <laughs>